great points. Um, and so I think now it looks like we've got a, a screen share from Dr. Campbell and um, we will pass, pass it on to him. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I really enjoy how active the, the uh, question answers are going. I think that that's uh, tremendous to see a lot of, a lot of questions uh, for this cancer. Um, so I'm going to discuss, and really the focus today is, is patients with, uh, uh, you know, cancer localized to the, to the urinary tract, not speaking as much about metastatic, though I'm happy to discuss in the, um, uh, in the chat uh, as we move forward. And so uh, these are my disclosures. And so you know, there's a lot of questions that always come up about best management. And so the way that I think about how, and the, the analogy that I like to use for uh, urothelial cancer in general, whether we're discussing neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which is before, or adjuvant therapy, which is, which is after, is my treatments with chemotherapy largely do a good job in killing worker bees but they can leave queen bees behind. And my colleagues in surgery are able to remove both. And so if you have cells that are in a resting state, chemotherapy has a hard time of working. Um, and that's, those are more of the queen bee cell types. And so I think there's a clear role at of oftentimes doing both. So what does the word adjuvant refer to? It's one that helps or facilitates if you look in the Webster Dictionary. And so when we use that in regards to uh, chemotherapy for adjuvant, it's something that enhances the effectiveness of medical treatment. So chemotherapy after surgery. Neoadjuvant is just referring to using this prior to that intervention. So to enhance prior to treatment, which would be surgery. And so, Let's start where we have, you know, currently the most evidence, which is uh, in the adjuvant setting, which is adjuvant chemotherapy. And so this was a trial that was done in uh, the UK called the Pouch Study. And on this study, they looked at patients that had had surgery uh, that was uh, done for upper tract disease, and they received either adjuvant chemotherapy with uh, two drugs, gemcitabine plus platinum. And the platinums could be a drug called cisplatin or a, a drug called carboplatin. And so when you look at the patients that received chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting, they did what appears to be much better with adjuvant chemotherapy. And so what you can see here is that there's a significant improvement in terms of uh, time until cancer came back. Um, and we're waiting to see if this is going to translate to overall survival, meaning that patients live longer uh, with this approach. And so there's some interesting things here. And I, I just, I want to point out, so we call these analysis when you look at papers, forest plots. And this is where we're trying to see if there are various um, groups of patients that tend to benefit most. And what we were very interested in is in bladder cancer, there is a sense that carboplatin is not helpful uh, if you give it prior to surgery or after surgery at preventing uh, recurrence. And when we look at this, anything above the one line means that the surveillance would be better. And so it appears that all of these groups tended to benefit from the chemotherapy, whether they had uh, nodes that were positive or negative, whether they received cisplatin or carboplatin, whether they had positive or negative margins, no matter their tumor status. And so while we look at this and say, well, it appears that the cisplatin potentially had more benefit, this little dotted line here is where the, the benefit seemed to, for all patients tended to be. And because this crosses this line, we can't say as a group that carboplatin um, is less effective here. And so my takeaway is that adjuvant platinum-based therapy can be beneficial. I do strongly feel because patients that in bladder cancer, we have such strong evidence with cisplatin. If patients are cisplatin eligible, then my preference is to give them cisplatin. 
Quality of life is always a very important consideration for patients, and there's a lot of concern about the toxicity with chemotherapy. Here, I think what this study does show is that patients do have a diminished quality of life while receiving chemotherapy, but you can see compared to patients that were on surveillance, quality of life is identical at six months. And so as a treatment trying to prevent recurrence of disease, most patients go through a period where their quality of life does suffer, but it does recover back to baseline. And I think that that's important. So I thought that this was a nice slide that was shown at the GU symposium this year. And this is one of the concerns that we have. And so if you do surgery and then are trying to see if a patient is going to be cisplatin eligible after surgery, the the majority of patients who would have potentially been cisplatin eligible prior to surgery is greatly diminished. And so each of these little figures represents two patients. And so basically 58% of patients would be eligible for cisplatin prior to surgery, while only about 15% of patients would be eligible after surgery. This number may be closer to 20 to 30%. It just depends on which literature you're reading but you're clearly losing patients who would potentially better tolerate chemotherapy by going to surgery first. And so Dr. Mateen has done a tremendous amount of work in this area um, uh, over really the last, long, over the last decade and longer, but looking at how um, patients, how can we look at uh, the benefit for potential a neoadjuvant approach? And so in this quick diagram, this is looking at the staging of patients uh, with similar stages at baseline. What was found at the time of surgery? Should they uh, go to immediately uh, to surgery? And what you can see here is, uh, is a good portion of patients with uh, a T3 tumor or T4 tumors. These are more aggressive tumors as compared to patients that receive chemotherapy with a higher chance of finding no evidence of tumor, which would be T0, carcinoma in situ only, or T1 disease with less patients with more aggressive presentation. And so looking at how do patients do with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and so this was one of the initial efforts, which was showing that at MD Anderson there was um, in our, in our looking back at patients who had received chemotherapy versus initial therapy, there what appeared to be an improvement in terms of uh, overall survival as well as disease-specific survival. So why do we look at both? Patients that are diagnosed with upper tract cancers are also at risk of having other health conditions, including hyper, high blood pressure, heart disease, and others. And so we always try to trace and see are these uh, potential deaths related to cancer or are they related to other reasons? And so we've recently updated this series and this was published um, uh, uh, earlier this year where we looked at five and 10 year outcomes. And what we basically saw was that if patients received chemotherapy, if we follow them out to uh, five years, uh, the risk of death was uh, really less than 10% from the cancer itself, but there were competing risks of death. And out to, to 10 years, uh, in the risk of death was about 15%, while there are other competing risks as well uh, for patients' health. Um, so going back to, to uh, the slides that were, or the presentation at ASCO, so Dr. Yip is a, a urologic oncology fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and they showed their, their study results, which included 57 patients who were treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, on a uh, prospective clinical trial. And what they were looking at is how well did they respond to the cisplatin chemotherapy, and pretty similar to, to what we found in a retrospective series, uh, the vast majority of patients did have a response and were downstaged. And in terms of not having invasive cancer, um, this number approached uh, 50%, which, which was um, 
uh, extremely promising compared to uh, historical evidence. Uh, there were patients that did not respond, and we're also interested in identifying patients less likely to benefit from this type of strategy. So how about where do we stand with immunotherapy? So immunotherapy has become a mainstay in the treatment of uh, metastatic urothelial cancer, and it's uh, used in uh, uh, for the majority of patients, either as uh, part of an initial therapy strategy where chemotherapy is often given first, followed by uh, a switch to immunotherapy. Patients who are not eligible for chemotherapy will often start with immunotherapy. Um, and so there, it's become a mainstay for us. But we have not had an, uh, an understanding, can we use immunotherapy to try to prevent um, a cancer from being initially muscle invasive to having recurrent or metastatic disease later. And this important study, uh, adjuvant nivolumab, uh, was published late last year. And what we basically saw in this study was the vast majority, as in most studies, were, bladder were patients with bladder tumors, uh, and about 20% or so involved what we consider upper tract, so renal, pelvis, or ureter. Um, on this study, looking at all patients that participated, there did appear to be a benefit for patients that received nivolumab, and this was statistically uh, significant. Uh, when they looked at a, a pre-planned subgroup, which involved patients who had pdl one expression, there appeared uh, to also be benefit and perhaps uh, a more substantial benefit in the subgroup though that is something that we are following longer um, and we are continuing to wait for the overall survival uh, data from this study. So the way that I describe how these drugs work to patients, so pdl one basically serves as a camouflage for these tumor cells. And when you have a T cell that is a, a basically trying to kill a cancer cell, it puts PD-1 on its surface as a safety flag. And when PD-1 interacts with PDL one it causes that immune cell to die or to hibernate. So when we use a drug like nivolumab that blocks PD-1, that actually rejuvenates these T cells to be more effective at killing cancer, and they don't care about this camouflage anymore. And so these drugs um, have made a, a have had a huge change for us in the metastatic setting. This is now FDA approved. If patients are not platinum eligible, I will consider this um, as an option for patients. And I discuss with them the pros and cons of both approaches. Um, in terms of side effects, the side effects with chemotherapy and immunotherapy are very different. With immunotherapy, there can be uh, at times rare, extremely serious side effects. Though on the study, about 10% of patients had significant side effects. And um, I quote patients a risk of death of one in 200 with immunotherapy. And with that, I, I thank everyone for their attention and more than happy to answer questions and happy to hear uh, Dr. Mateen and Dr. Murray's thoughts on this topic as well. Great. Uh, I, thank you so much, Dr. Campbell. I think that was a, a great overview. Um, I'm just going to reiterate what you said earlier of, of how lucky, you know, you are to get to work with Dr. Mateen and really, you know, use his guidance, um, you know, of what he sees in the patient and the discussion that he's kind of laid out up front. Um, on the flip side of that, you know, uh, there's, there's so many patients that, that I see and that we see as urologists that, you know, we're weighing out this chemotherapy or not chemotherapy and, and what, are our, what are our things. And so it absolutely goes the opposite direction as well. Um, and I think, especially with patients with high risk disease and patients that we're worried about, you know, having both a urologist and a medical oncologist on board in your case for urothelial cell carcinoma um, is, is so important. 